British countryside is literally riddled with castles and their often ruinous remains. From imposing Norman towers to picturesque pleasure palaces, there's about as many castles as there are sheep. Well, maybe not in England, but perhaps in Wales. No person is more synonymous with building castles than one of England's most notorious kings, Edward I. Also known as Edward Longshanks because of his gangly stature. Thanks to Hollywood, Edward is notorious for having Mel Gibson hanged, drawn and quartered. And I should probably clarify that I'm referring to the infamous William Wallace of Scotland. Quite appropriately known as the Hammer of the Scots, Edward is also notorious for his treatment of the Welsh and their sheep. They're probably not the sheep to be honest. Throughout his reign and that of his father Henry III, Edward was engaged in a bitter territorial struggle with the Lords of Wales and in particular the self-proclaimed Prince of Wales, Llewellyn Ap Gruffydd. Relations between the English and the Welsh had been strained for years, but in the latter part of the 13th century, Edward's tolerance of Llewellyn came to an end and things got messy. It is here then that Edward embarks on one of the most ambitious building projects ever seen in medieval Europe. In order to finally beat the Welsh into submission, he constructed an iron ring of eight bloody massive castles. Castles on this scale had never been seen before in Britain, and we can only imagine the effect that they must have had on the locals. From the relatively modest garrison at Harlech to the monstrous, unfinished palace at Balmorris, we're taking a look at the mighty castles of Edward I. Prior to William the Conqueror's invasion of England in 1066, castles as we know them didn't really exist in Britain. The castle was very much a Norman import, and they were constructed as a means of the Normans being able to secure their hold on England. The first fortifications were known as Mott and Bailey castles. A huge man-made mound or mott would be constructed and a wooden fort would be erected on top of it. A wooden enclosure known as a bailey would then be situated at the bottom. Clifford's Tower in York is a good example of a Mott and Bailey castle. Sure, the wooden fort has been replaced with a stone one and the bailey no longer exists, but you get the picture. These simple castles were ideal as they were relatively cheap and quick to build. As basic as they were, nothing like this had ever been seen before, so they must have made quite an impression on the English population. Although Moss and Bailey castles were being constructed well into the 12th century, the Normans began using stone in the immediate few years after 1066. Some Moss and Bailey castles were converted into stone, and the idea of the self-contained stone keep began to emerge. As soon as 1078, construction of the White Tower at the Tower of London began. Nothing on this scale had been attempted since the Romans, and we can imagine that the local population were utterly gobsmacked. Even today, the White Tower is a massively imposing structure. These huge stone keeps are synonymous with the Normans, and demonstrate how nervous William and his lords must have been following the invasion. The English did not merely bow down after the Battle of Hastings, and these impressive stone keeps are all part of William's desire to further strengthen his hold on England and emphasise his authority as ruler. Rochester and Colchester castles are further examples of early Norman stone keeps. Colchester, however, stands at only half of its original height. Castles were built to this design for many years, and it was not until the 13th century that things changed. The strong castle keep design lost favour and the castles of New were built to a much more sophisticated design. The new concentric design advocated the idea of having multiple layers of defence, or walls within walls. And this leads us nicely onto King Edward, or rather it will do when I tell you how this new castle design emerged. So flashback to 1066. The Normans have killed a few Anglo-Saxons at the Battle of Hastings and the English King Harold Godwinson has been killed, allegedly after receiving an arrow through the eye. Nasty. The conquerors spread out through England, putting down English resistance and building as many as 1,000 Mott and Bailey castles. They are very much secure in the country and asserting their authority. Now, the border region between England and Wales has always been hotly contested and William the Conqueror decided to formally subdue these borderlands by creating semi-independent lordships that he gave to his mates. The lords who settled here were technically not answerable to the English king and were free to rule as they saw fit. This border region became known as the March after the Anglo-Saxon word for boundary 
and the March of Lords were at almost constant conflict with their Welsh neighbours. Fast forward to the 13th century. Relations between England and Wales are at breaking point. Edward's father, Henry, has secured new territories in northern Wales, but has become distracted due to civil unrest in England. Llewellyn manages to claw back his territories in Gwynedd, and Henry has no choice but to sign the Montgomery Peace Treaty in 1267. Under this, he formally grants Llewellyn the title Prince of Wales, and in return, Llewellyn agrees to do homage to Henry and pay him a hefty fine. In spite of this new treaty, the March of Lords continue to act independently and continue to scrap with their Welsh neighbours. In particular, March of Lord Gilbert de Clare continues in his efforts to expand his borders in sporadic warfare in Shores. Set against this background of conflict, Britain's first ever concentrically designed castle begins to take shape. Commissioned by Gilbert de Clare, the massive fortress at Carfilly cost a gargantuan £19,000 to build. Even the King of England would have struggled to have afforded this. This new state-of-the-art concentric design had never been seen before, and the fortification consisted of two separate sets of perimeter walls surrounded by artificial lakes. The castle itself sits on an island and would have been highly defensible. Carfilly was considered the finest castle in Europe, and even today it stands as the second largest castle in Britain. So impressed was the young Prince Edward that all of his future castles would follow this sophisticated design. When Edward succeeded to the English throne in 1272, he inherited a country very much brought to its knees by civil war. He quickly embarked on a program of reform, bringing to justice corrupt sheriffs and bailiffs and enforcing law and order. He also set about restoring the authority of the crown. The citizens of London had very much been a pain in Edward's derriere, and as such he sought to subdue the local population by vastly updating his defences at the Tower of London. A new set of castle walls were added, and a new moat was dug around the complex. The castle's towers and gatehouses were also greatly improved, and a new mighty entrance was constructed. The Tower of London now replicated the concentric defences at Carfilly, and the castle we see today is largely a result of Edward's vision. On the issue of Wales, Edward had lost patience. The Prince of Wales, Llewellyn ap Gruffydd, was not playing ball, and Edward declared war. In 1276, the English invaded Wales, Edward personally had his sights set on Llewellyn's Principality of Gwynedd and led a northern army out of Chester. The king, however, had no remaining bases in Wales, largely thanks to his father, and therefore commissioned three new castles. Edward first marched to Flint, where he constructed his first fortification. Built upon naturally defensible marshy lands, the fortification was built to a very unique design. The inner and outer baileys were separated by a tidal moat and a distinctive tower keep was erected between them. This was capable of defending both baileys. The location of the castle was also ideal as it stood only a day's march from Chester and could be supplied by the sea. Significantly, this was the first castle to be built by Edward's new Savoyard builder, Master James of St George. At the same time as Edward secured Flint, an army commanded by his brother Edmund marched out of Carmarthen, their destination Aberystwyth. Here, Edward's second castle was built. Very little of Aberystwyth Castle remains today, but we know it was one of Edward's first concentrically designed castles. The complex is built in the shape of a diamond with two sets of walls and large towers at the corners. A large jewel-towered keep gatehouse was also erected at the castle's entrance, along with a barbican. Visitors, or would-be attackers, would also have had to cross a drawbridge before accessing the gatehouse. The largest and most impressive of Edward's new castles was founded at Rudlin. In keeping with his desire to have all of his castles situated next to the water, Edward embarked on the monumental task of straightening a two-mile stretch of the River Clyde. Situated ten miles west of Flint, Rudlin was built to a similar design as Aberystwyth. As with its sister castle, two sets of walls ensured the best possible defence. The massive internal walls were square in shape and featured two huge twin tower gatehouses and two turreted towers. The outer walls sat lower and were defensible by additional smaller towers. Rudlin was a really impressive fortification and this can be seen in the dual tower gatehouse still standing today. Another castle commissioned at this time by Edward was constructed at Beulith in mid Wales. Unfortunately, nothing of this castle remains today, except for the original motte and earthworks. 
Bulif is actually believed to have been Edward's first Welsh castle, and would have been built to a Mott and Bailey design, but surrounded by two sets of stone walls. Edward had begun constructing an iron ring of castles around Wales, and it soon became obvious to Llewellyn and his allies that all was lost. Strangely, the English king stopped short of a total conquest and devised a further peace agreement. Llewellyn was allowed to keep many of his lands in Gwynedd, and would retain his title Prince of Wales. His position in Wales, however, was massively undermined. He was very much Edward's bitch now. In 1282, a further rebellion broke out. The Welsh were unhappy with English rule and tired of having their rights suppressed. Llewellyn and his younger brother Daffid led attacks on Edward's castles and Aberystwyth was taken. Naturally, Edward was enraged and he sought to fight back. A three-pronged attack was again utilised with armies marching into North Mid and Southern Wales. Like in 1276, the Welsh were unable to resist the might of England and Llewellyn was killed. His brother Daffid suffered an altogether more horrendous fate and was hanged, drawn, and quartered. And that's a pretty bloody horrible way to go. Edward had achieved what no English king had ever done before. The ancient dominions of Wales were now his, and he quickly set about asserting his authority. Three new castles were commissioned at Harlick, Conway, and Carnarthen. All of these castles would be built next to the ocean and were situated only a day's march apart. The first of the new castles was Harlick, at £8,000, it was not exactly cheap, but it was the cheapest of the three. Harlick is built upon a naturally defensible outcrop of rock, giving it a really startling and imposing silhouette. As with all of Edward's new castles, his architect, Master James, gave Harlick two sets of castle walls. These, along with the massive gatehouse keep and the internal buildings, were all squeezed into a relatively small area. Although it's not clear now, in Edward's day, the ocean would have come right up to the bottom of the castle. Supplies would have been brought up to the garrison by a series of steep steps. Edward's second mighty castle is situated at Conway. Perched above a steep platform of rock, the castle overlooks the Conway estuary and makes for a truly magnificent sight. Even more sophisticated and cutting edge than Harlick, Conway Castle is easily my favourite. For me, this is just a picture perfect fortification and represents everything I love about medieval castles. It almost looks like something you might build on the beach, and would have looked even more stunning with its original coat of whitewash. Edward was very much making a statement with Conway, and it's no surprise that it was constructed on the site of a Cistercian monastery built by Llewellyn's father. Edward was keen to eradicate anything associated with the previous dynasty, and Conway very much represented the new management. How then do you better the stunning design at Conway? How do you improve on perfection? Well. Edward and his architect, Master James, certainly felt optimistic with their flagship fortress at Carnarvon. Carnarvon is so elaborate, so stunning, that it's hard to believe it was built in medieval Britain. In fact, it's no surprise that Edward took inspiration from the mighty Roman walls at Constantinople. The walls at Carnarvon incorporate branded colour stone, and the huge towers are not round, but rather polygonal, like those at Constantinople. The design of the complex is also very unique in that it follows a figure of eight shape. This is in fact more to do with the lay of the land and gives the castle a very narrow footprint. Carnarvon really was state of the art. The mighty King's Gate would have seen would-be attackers having to cross two drawbridges before passing through dual towers and no fewer than six portcullises and five solid oak doors. If that wasn't enough, attackers would have been pelted from above by arrows, rocks and god knows what else. This magnificent gatehouse was not just designed to keep the baddies out, however. Its use as a ceremonial entrance for royal guests would have been just as important. Although £27,000 was thrown at Carnarvon, it was in fact never finished and none of the internal buildings are left standing today. It's fair to say then that Edward and his master builder, James of St George, had become pretty adept in the art of castle building. Edward had taken the concentric castle design from the relatively modest fortification at Rudlin through to the almost perfectly designed fortress at Carnarvon. He had in effect encircled all of Wales with his mighty castles and had, he believed, finally subdued the Welsh. He was not quite there however and a further uprising in 1294 identified a vulnerability in Edward's iron ring of castles. The uprising had originated from the island of Anglesey and it was clear that a further castle was required. 
Balmoris, on the eastern tip of the island, was chosen as the site for the new fortress, and for the first time Master James was not limited by the lay of the land. Balmoris then presented an opportunity like no other, and the castle that began to emerge from the marshes was truly and spectacularly fantastic. The castle incorporates two sets of mighty walls, surrounded by a large moat. The design of the fortress is perfectly symmetrical, and it incorporates an unusually large courtyard, capable of providing accommodation for up to five royal households. A deep water dock ensured the garrison would be easily supplied. Unfortunately, whilst Balmoris was being constructed, Edward was at war with both France and Scotland. Finances were stretched to the limit, and this state-of-the-art fortification at Balmoris was never completed. How we see it today is largely the same as it would have looked when Edward died in 1306. The walls sit at only half of their intended height, and none of the internal buildings were ever built. What remains of Balmoris is truly and utterly astounding, and even in its unfinished form, the castle stands as one of the most impressive examples of 13th century architecture. We can only imagine how it might have looked in its finished form. The Welsh castles of Edward I stand as a reminder of what the mighty English king achieved in Wales. Not only had he succeeded in finally subduing the Welsh, but the fortresses he built represent the pinnacle of castle building in Britain. Whilst two of his eight castles stand unfinished, it is fair to say that these are some of the most impressive medieval structures still standing in the world today. For me then, this is Edward's greatest legacy.